Good evening guys, got five minutes before we actually get going with this, but I thought we'd just check the usual uh, sound things. I've checked them, but obviously you guys in the chat, if you can just post up and say, yes, you can hear me, it's clear, it's loud, it's too noisy, it's too quiet. Because uh, to be honest, I've got a brand new cable. Uh, we found the reason last week, the cable, um, well, it wasn't very good. I don't know if you guys used to hear it. Every now and again, you get a wiggle and it crackled. Uh, it was the cable playing up. So we have a brand new red cable this week. Um, so if you can give me uh, an idea just to make sure, I'm pretty sure the level should be the same as normal, but if you can pop in the chat and let me know, you can actually hear me. Uh, usual thing, I've got the chat room set up. I'm in the chat room in the lobby system there. So you can talk to me there and ask questions as we go. Uh, and obviously you can ask out questions, post up more of the technical ones, shall we say, uh, on the actual forum section for it as well. But if you could, one of you guys can give me a shout. Thank you, Andy. Very nice. Uh, I say, it's one of those things. I can hear you, sounds nice and level to me. Thank you very much there, Brian. So good evening to you too. <coughs> Great even, that's the one. <laughs> hey, trust me, your the typing's better than mine earlier because I had to completely redo mine. Um, I have posted it up on our Facebook page as well. Some of you are saying about, uh, you know, when do you know exactly go live? So anyway, I've just posted it up on there. So if you're not subscribed to our Facebook page, click in, in there and I tend to keep up things. Also, I post up pictures occasionally. Uh, but to be honest, it's when I remember these things. So I trust you all very well. Uh, so this evening we're going to be basically covering spraying the model. Now, to be honest, I was going to do Buster and I have sounded him, but whew, he is rough as, yeah. So it's never going to be good. And as we'll talk about, you know, obviously it's all to do with layers and levels. And if you start off bad, you're just in for a bit of a rough ride. So quite frankly, uh, poor old Buster. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what's going to happen to him at some point. Uh, I will sort him out. I had every envision that the end of this this series that we're doing is making him like chrome like new or something. Yeah, I think that's going to be a, a tall order with that one. So, right. A tired with a capital K. <coughs> okay, so who else have we got in now? I don't know how many people we got in the chatting area online tonight. Oh, quite a few of you already. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 13, crikey. Unlucky for some, lucky for us. So good evening, Jim, Neil, Brian, Gary, uh, Renee, uh, Daniel, Andrew, Andy, uh, Seven, uh, Paul, Harold, Eric, and Martin. Good evening, great to have you here. So hope you're all well. To be honest, I am not gonna be able to put up the uh, review for the uh, Hobby Boss um, uh, fitter tonight because we're doing this. Uh, if I uploaded it, I can do this because I can't do two things at once. So that is looks like it's going to go up tomorrow night. But to be honest, it is a great kit. Be well worth it. I'll get that up with you tomorrow as well as my interview that I did with Jamie will be up with you tomorrow night. So absolutely stacks for you to do over the weekend. It is, yeah, Neil. Uh, purely because I say Buster, it's not good and. I've had this one kicking around from when we had the kids down here building and this is one of their leftover projects. So I thought, right, he'll do. Maybe a little quieter than usual. Okay, well that's something I can deal with. I can up it a little bit. Uh, where are we? Right, how's that? That's up by uh, about 10% overall on that one so hopefully uh, <laughs> well it's either Brian you have me or the fitter don't answer that <laughs> so there we go but it is I tell you I have to say I know everyone kicks the to death the kitty hawk one um, but this is really nice definitely well worth it I must admit <clears throat> one piece fuselage that's all I'm saying that's a winner to me straight off the bat Right, okay, so where are we? Two minutes to run. Goody, goody. Okay, everything else is in. Just making sure we're all good. We're okay out there. Uh, levels are good over there. Frame drops, zero, which is always good. Okay, looks like we're all okay. <laughs> Very good, Neil. Is that a good fitter? Are you here all week for that one? <laughs> We could do all the fitter jokes, actually, because to be honest, John, uh, uh, you know, he's got his eye on this kit. He'll be in in a minute. Is he not in already? Can we talk about him behind his back? Yeah, he's not in yet. But I know John wants this kit. So he said to me, if you don't want it, I'll have it off of you. But actually, now I've reviewed it, I quite fancy doing the idea of having it. 
It's got separate wing tips as well. You get both ones, swept and single, and you plug them in. Nice little touches with it. Okay, so where are we? We're just coming up on the hour now. Okay, let me just make sure. Always have plenty of kitchen roll lying around when you're airbrushing. Because if you need to grab a bit and you haven't got it, it's always the way. Okay, so let's just make sure we got those in. Got a roll, we've got our paints. Down there. Make sure we got air. Okay. We are good, right. Uh, the Eddard kit, uh, fitter, is, the old, is it the Capo kit? Am I correct in thinking? Somebody likes that. Look, everyone's just jumped in now. Everyone's flying in here. Okay. <laughs> Finally found the chat room. No problem, Gene. Great to have you here. Yeah, Spence, I must admit, I was looking at Spence's one the other week. We, we had a few of the guys here and we were looking at it. And I must admit, it uh, he's doing a cracking job on that one. But then a lot of people have. Everyone's done really good jobs. Right, okay. I think we'll be making a start now, guys. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend we haven't been talking. We're going to do this. <coughs> Okay, then we're going to do this. Good evening and welcome to, what's this, episode three of the live uh, Flory Models airbrushing tutorial course, show you how to, what not to do mainly, uh, and everything else like that. So good evening and welcome. Usual thing, the uh, chat rooms is open. Um, where's that? Oh, it's, sorry, it's coming up slowly. Um, so usual thing, if you've got any questions, you can talk to me live as we do this in the chat room. I'll keep my eye on that. If you want to pop in there, there's a load of you piling in there now, which is great. Uh, if you've got a bit more technical type question, if you can please post it up into the actual forum uh, for this particular one. So if you just go to live shows, it's under uh, live airbrushing, 8th of um, June, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, show, pop it down in there. And then obviously I can look at those questions a little bit more technical than it actually would be uh, in the chat area. Because obviously I do miss them because they skip. Okay, so if you've got a specific question, better to put it in the forum and I can answer it. And then also from that point of view, people who are watching this as a recording, they can see that because obviously I have got no way of showing people the chat uh, in the same time. In theory, I could, but that's complicated. That's something I'm planning on for future live shows where we're going to have the chat streaming the same time as we talk. I don't know, we'll get there one day. But anyway, good evening to everybody who's live in the actual chat room with me. Thank you very much for helping me out with the sound check. I'm hoping our sound this week will be getting rid of all those gremlins we had last week because we have a new cable and everything else like that. Okay, so over the last few weeks, we've been talking at length about the basics of airbrushing. So we've discussed um, the pros and cons to airbrushing, we've spoken about the pros and cons of the different types of paint you can actually use, your airbrushing, and generally your equipment, and what you're looking for when you're laying down paint on big sheets of A4 and things like this, okay? Now, the great thing about, obviously, these big sheets of A4 of plastic art is it's a hard surface, it's not easy to spray onto, it's not very forgiving at all. So what it does, it just magnifies any problems that you've got on a smaller scale. But as you can see, when you're dealing on something like this, uh, and you have this guy, for instance, um, you know, obviously you can't see anything really that's going on here. It's gonna get covered very quickly and taken care of. That's why it's nice to see it on a big piece of, you know, card as you've got it here. You can look at it, you can see exactly where you're going wrong. You can see the edges of your paintwork. It's really hard to do it on here. So that's why I recommend having something like a bit of plastic card, ideally, just to spray on, just to get a feel of what's going on. So that way you can see what's going on, okay? We often talk about hearing it and listening to your airbrush. We're gonna be talking about that a lot tonight, okay? But at the same time, you wanna be just knowing what was going on, the reasons why, and how to adjust it without stressing out. At the end of the day, don't forget, airbrushing is supposed to be as fun as every other part of the hobby. It shouldn't be one of those pits where you get to and it gets quite stressful and get quite tense. And that is the thing, you wanna relax. We spoke about it before, relax the shoulders, deep breaths in and out, sniff this lovely thinners and products that we all have here, okay? And then that way, when you're laying down the paint, it all flows through, okay? So from our point of view, um, we are gonna be using a, um, 
relatively new, uh, 70 second scale lightning. Okay, now to be honest, this is left over when I had a few kids around here doing some airbrushing last year, and they all built a lightning whilst they were here. Okay, um, Buster originally was gonna get the job, but he is awful. Now, one of the things we're gonna speak about as well is obviously the finish of your paintwork needs to be pretty good on every single level. It doesn't need to be perfect, but you do need a certain type of finish. So the thing is, Buster has had so many coats of paint now, he's rough. And when we're rough, we are talking really rough. Yeah, there's words that spring to mind, which I won't repeat, but he is literally that rough, okay? Um, so the thing is, from straight off of that first coat of paint going down, it's gonna then just get worse every single time you go on top of it. He needs to be stripped back completely, sanded, polished, primed, and then you start again, okay? So from our point of view, what we've got down in front of us is, okay, we've actually got this guy, Okay, so this is our little lightning here. Um, again, he's, he's pretty good, to be honest. So the kids did a great job putting this one together, all right? He has had a coat of paint on a wing, which I did for a, an old demo a long, long time ago, but the other side is relatively, um, you know, paint free. Now, this side, to be honest, just had a coat of, if I remember rightly, it was something like microfilla or something else on here, okay? But from the start, when you finish doing your painting work and you've been sanding and you've been doing all those bits to your model and all the rest of it over the, you know, the build up to actually get into the paint you can get a lot of debris gets caught up in panel lines in the surface and just all over your model okay as soon as you start coming in with paint these bits are going to get caught up in the surface of your paint and again we're into this thing each level is just going to get worse so really what you want to do is get down in here and uh, if we just use any airbrush I suppose okay you just want to pop in here and blow out the entire model to get rid of any dust in the panel lines, in wells, anywhere on this, so it's completely good all the way through. Okay, so from that point of view, you're not going to be picking up dust and just shoving it around your entire model. Now, the other thing as well, you can buy things like plastic prep, you can buy various things to help this out, but actually, what I quite like to do is a little bit of airbrush cleaner. Okay. So airbrush cleaner isn't as heavy duty as coming in with thinners and all the rest of it. So you can just give it a bit of a wipe, all right? And you can just rub it lightly over the model. And what you're gonna do is take off any fingerprints, any greasy marks, anything whatsoever that's gonna affect sticking, cause grief, or anything else like that actually on your model, okay? So from that point of view, it just makes things a lot easier when handling it and making your way through. All right, so again, quick whip and you're good to go. Now the thing is the model will now be tacky to touch, okay? So you just need to let that naturally dry off. All right, so if it dries off, you'll be absolutely fine, okay? So is this actually drying now? you'll be good to go. Normally you would make sure you've done a lot better job right the way over your entire model, okay? So once you're happy that you're in a good, you know, clean model, also think about your environment, okay? One of the big things, obviously, I have a problem with, uh, although it's great to have a uh, huge, big uh, system like this, the trouble that I have actually is that I get a lot of dust, and I don't know if you can see it, but if I do this, I'll get dust and it's airborne, and what it does, it will lay down, but also it'll go on your model, it's not particularly nice, it can cause, you know, obviously the same type of thing, texture issues, grittiness in there, and everything else. So what you wanna do, ideally, is wet the entire area down, make sure you've got, obviously, if you're using things like, you know, kitchen roll, stuff like that, make sure it's a lint-free variety, a better quality bounty, as I call it, or kitchen towel, is far superior to the cheap stuff. The cheap stuff leeches those tiny little hairs that get stuck in your paint, because as you're brushing and blowing it down, and they go airborne and get stuck to your model. Again, tiny little thing, stage one, five coats later, it's turned out to looking like you've got a dog hair through your paint and all the rest of it, because it will just get worse with every single coat, all right? So just think about generally your environment, you know, how you're working and everything else. Trust me, not so bad if you're doing glosses, but as soon as you go into metal finishes, uh, sorry, not so bad if you're doing flat coats, but as soon as you go into metal finishes or you're into obviously the realm of glosses, then you want it all to be perfect. There's a good reason why car painters wet down their entire work surfaces, you know, the floors, absolutely everything before they paint. It's to literally hold down that dust, keep it on the floor. Same thing goes with our modeling. So I've seen a lot of people when they model, 
the spray booths, there are old filters in there, it's dusty as hell, and it's literally just getting stuck to your model. And that's where probably 50% of everything, problems you've got are occurring because it only takes, it's the pearl syndrome, that tiny bit of grit and sand that's irritated in your paintwork, only takes a few coats and it gets worse, okay? And then obviously before you know it, you've got a really rough surface, okay? So first up, priming. Is it necessary? Not really, okay? Priming is one of those things where, again, some people do it, some people don't. We speak about it a lot, gloss work. The minimum amount of coats you can get away with, the better, okay? Certain paints, uh, we've been discussing it a lot recently, MRPs, we've all sort of come to the conclusion that MRP, really, you need a primer down. Uh, it's not good enough to really bite into the surface of the plastic like other paints do. It tends to sit on the top a little bit more, all right? Even though it's a hot product and all the rest of it, so a primer coat works. Now there's two types of priming, okay? You've got your priming where you're trying to hide all those little imperfections, okay? And as I spoke about it in this afternoon's vlog, that way you're probably better off with your polyurethane, your thick, gloopy type primers, okay? Because what's gonna happen is they're gonna cover up all the little tiny imperfections, all those little scratches that you don't wanna see. Also, those little bits where you've got like filler and you've sanded it, but the filler still got that slight texture over the top. So when you put a coat over it, it absorbs into uh, the actual filler so it doesn't look perfect and all the same. Obviously a primer coat takes care of that. Also with priming it shows all your imperfections so if you've got seam lines, if you've got joins, you know scratches, things like that, the primer coat will show it up before you come in with your proper paint. Okay so from that point of view it's actually pretty much a good thing to have. Is it a must? No, by no means is it a must, it's personal choice. Many times I won't bother priming, other things I will, okay? But then again, it is one of those things, personal choice. Sometimes it depends on the paint you're using, lacquers, chrome finishes, you probably do want a primer down on there first. If you're just using, you know, Tamiya, you know, flat, you probably don't need it, okay? So, from that point of view, you've got a couple of options, okay? Polyurethane primers, Steinol resins, those bigger, thicker ones and all the rest of it are great for just chucking it down. Drawback to it is, well, there's multiples, but at the end of the day, speed and time, okay? The cheap alternative is to just use a standard acrylic paint. Tamiya X19 is something I've been priming with for the last 20 years. It's easy, it's a 50-50 mix. You just put it on, blow it down. It, you can paint onto it within minutes. You can sand it in minutes, no problem at all, okay? Then there's the more professional type primer, shall we say. So from our point of view, just down in here, we've got some AK primer. They call it a micro filler. Trust me, micro filler means it hardly covers anything, but all you're gonna do is give a perfectly nice finish to your paint to go onto. It's not gonna hide anything. If you've got scratches, imperfections, filler marks, you are not gonna hide them under this stuff, okay? It's just gonna show it through and through, no matter how many coats you put on it. But this one is really designed for coating your paint in prep your model in preparation for the paint coat actually going down. Okay, so see it more as your first coat of paint than a primer. Okay, the great thing about this stuff is if you've got photo etch we spoke about, if you've got you know metal barrels things like that, the micro filler primers they go on beautifully because they don't fill up all the details that they might have. It's a very very thin. Just think of it just like a very very thin primer coat. Okay, so. Great, but if you need to hide some stuff, you might want to go back to the other way. If you want to play somewhere in the middle, then just take Tamiya any color. I've done it in green before where you get low on paint as a primer, okay? 50-50 mix, spray it down onto your model, you'll be absolutely fine, okay? So we've covered it before loads and loads of times, but mixing up your paint and various things is just as important with every single coat you do, okay? So it's not just a case of, right, okay, for your paint coat, it's with your primers and everything, because from now on, you're layering up, okay? So you might end up having to like rub back a layer, especially if you want it perfect and stuff like that. So again, it is personal choice on how exactly you want it, okay? So what we're gonna do with this guy, just as a little bit of a thing, we're gonna give it three different types of primer on here, okay? We're gonna come in with uh, a Tamiya 50-50 mix. We're just gonna spray this down on one wing, okay? We're gonna come in with a micro filler primer on the other, just to put that down on there like that, okay? And then actually I've got a lacquer primer as well, which we're gonna pop on the bottom, and then we can look at the differences and the drying times and everything else like that. For speed tonight, I'm not gonna use enamels, purely because they will take too long to dry and I won't have time to hold it or anything else like that, okay? So the other thing as well, holding your model. If there is a way of holding your model without touching it, perfect, okay? Because then that way you're gonna avoid putting fingerprints on it, grease on it, 
and all those nasties. And even just holding it on the edges, as soon as you start to wear through leading edges of wings or in different areas, then you're gonna cause problems as you make your way right the way through. So if you have got a way of supporting it, and usually there's a, you know interesting ways of doing it, sticking things obviously up their bum, sticking them in through the front if it's propeller driven, or just generally up through wheel wells, stuff like that, it helps. If you can't, many times I'll just work on the tail. So I'll hold it on the tail, do the rest of the model. Once it's done, I will then switch off and then do the tail afterwards. That way I've got something to hold it all the time. But if you can do it like this, it's handy because over here I've got my vise, I can put it in there. Or if you've got a sponge block, you can shove it in there. Okay, so it holds it up whilst it's all drying and everything else like that. Okay, so first up, are you all still with me? Are we all sounding okay? <clears throat> Who sees what? Sniffing glue, right. <laughs> There's a delay. Is there a delay on the audio? There shouldn't be. It may be just the different ways the cameras are working and things like that. Okay, so uh, let's just have this. All right, so phase one, what we're going to do is with the Tamiya. So on this, we're just going to put some grey paint over this so we get a better contrast. Some of you were saying last week about getting a contrast. Now, Tamiya paint, we spoke about mixing it up. Obviously, you can use uh, X20A we've got here. You could use acrylic airbrush thinners. Personally, self-leveling thinners in its name everything's level right the way through makes it really really handy so what we're going to do is we're just going to put down in here we're not going to need tons of this because obviously we're only doing a small amount okay and then we're just going to put in here 50 50 mix of the old thinners goes in brush favorite brush that i know doesn't leach hairs and a damn good mix. Again, what we were saying about last week about paint mixes and that, the reason we didn't have any problems with the painting and stopping and starting and everything else like that is a good mix. The bit where you just chuck it in your color cup is with the bit where you start to play with fire, things don't work as well, okay? So from uh, my point of view, what we're gonna use today, I'll tell you what, let's do something a little bit different. Uh, let's try it with the Neo. So we're gonna try a different, few different types of airbrushes. Okay, so what we're going to try is, this is the uh, Iwata Neo. We know it's not made by Iwata, but it's close enough, all right? So, usual thing, we're just going to pop in here a little bit of thinners. We've got lacquer type paints going in through here, so we're just going to put a drop of thinners in here, just to coat everything up and get everything started. Okay, so that is in. And then we're just going to tip our painting, which we know is quite nice. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you're just doing a small area or a large area or anything in between. Okay, so then all we're going to do, first of all over here we're going to check our flow. So just gently easing back on the trigger. Okay, and we're listening to it. It sounds pretty good. It's not crackling, it's not spitting or hissing or anything else like that. It does sound pretty good okay the only thing is you might hear it sounds extremely strong okay so I'm going to knock my air pressure up down just a little bit and I'm just trying to listen from when it starts crackling and I can hear it crackling there so I'm going to up my air pressure just a little bit blow it so you don't get any dried stuff on the end okay and then we're going to come in and do this. Now we've got a wing root here, so we're going to come in nice and close, dusty coat still, but we're just going to put down a little light coat. Okay, happy with that, and I'm just going to walk along the edges. Okay, and now we've done it, I'm just going to put a light coat. So we're just hardly pulling back on the trigger, and distance wise, we're probably around about, I don't know, four centimeters, three centimeters away just a light coat and hopefully you can see it just sort of changes color just a little bit okay we're just going to build it up a little bit second coat coming in okay pretty good no problem with that at all happy how it's going down we know it's drying so what we're going to do now is just push and then no pull back on the trigger just to dry back okay so what we've made now is a nice base for the paint to go on. So it doesn't matter if you were using this as the top coat or as a primer, it's now got a dry coat. So this second one going on can be a lot closer, okay, and slow your movement and almost paint it on now, okay? So you can see the paint physically going down. Okay, we're still not to, trying to do a total perfect job on it, 
because we're trying to build it up but we can get in here now and put in a very nice coat of paint okay we're just going to go down the edge and we're just slowing down because we can put a lot more paint over to this surface okay and it's looking a little bit wet but that's good okay and we're just slowing everything because it can take the the weight of the paint on there we're just going to do the flat okay anytime it's looking dusty just air only and just air over the top now so you could use a hair dryer or whatever you wanted so technically we've sort of done three coats but i would say it's more sort of two and a half and it has coated that and we're just drying it down so it's going to go nice and flat because obviously it's tamia flat Okay, and there we go, that's done. So, uh, so does uh, spraying perpendicular to the surface, uh, is it an advantage or doesn't it really matter with primer? On your primer coat, because you're not looking for total perfection, you're okay. If you're in with glosses and stuff like that, you want it to be very nice if you can, uh, but it's not as important. I tend to run it at an angle, so it's got air moving over it as well. But hopefully you can see, it's got a few little wet spots up here, but it is very smooth. Uh, it's like a satin finish right the way over it. It's not rough at all. Obviously, I don't want to drag it around. We can just about, and this is totally smooth, okay? There's no roughness to it. It feels extremely silky, and that's actually the surface we want. There's no lumps and bumps as you run your finger over it. Uh, and obviously, all the details you can see are exactly where they were before we came in with the paint. You also might notice how we've blended in. We have that gray color over this end of the wing. It's now totally blended in. So it's covered that entire wing perfectly well. Now this will be as good as what you would need for putting on a paint coat normally, let alone a primer. Okay, but that's that thing. So think of it when you're putting down your paint like speed. First one, you don't want to hang around because you don't want to flood the area. So it's quite quick all the way over it dust it down there and everything else like that okay but then as you've got a little bit of paint on there you slow down your thing because what you need the surface to do is to be slightly wet now okay you don't want it to be dry as you're spraying it on there because otherwise you're going to get texture and you're going to get that rough finish to your paintwork but because it's wet it's melting into itself so it's giving its time to self level and dry as it's going on there now and gives you a very nice silky smooth finish and as you can see there's nothing in there uh, at all that is going to affect uh, any of the finish so there's no sort of gritty bits dusty marks uh, textured paint there's no swirls there's no wet marks you know it is what it is of just being dead flat very nice paint okay so even what we do is we're going to run a little bit just down here on the nose and we're going to repeat it just to use up our little bit of paint we got left down in here but as you can see it is that thing it just it will cover even nasty marks like we were saying so this one is quite dusty just to get down because it's got something to grip to. Once it's there, you can physically slow down the speed of your movement. So you're physically pushing it over the, the surface. Okay, and you're looking for it to go just wet and then stop. Okay, as soon as it gets too wet, you're gonna have problems. So what you do, you just release the trigger, all air, Come away a little bit now, keep your distance and then dust down. But hopefully you can see how it's actually covered all of that rough paint uh, as it goes down there. Okay, so it's not a problem uh, at any point, even if you've got a little bit of texture down there, because we were saying this is the sort of jack of all trades type paints. Uh, it's not going to cover uh, as well as obviously a thicker, gloopier uh, type primer, but it's going to cover damn sight better than the micro primers do, which basically just show absolutely everything okay so just think of your speed as you're painting as it goes down and it's just finding that point where it's just you know just starting to look wet and you just move away from it just to keep it all moving okay uh, right okay if there is nothing uh, on the surface uh, like a wing uh, I do it perpendicular if it's flat on a cockpit angles. Again, it's personal sort of choice on the perpendicular thing. It depends what you're doing. A lot of perpendicular type work when you're doing it, I'll be honest with you, that is more a case of camo. 
or when you want that tire detail, which is something a little bit further on to what we're doing at the moment. At the moment, we're just trying to talk about putting down a nice coat of paint everywhere, okay? When you're coming in with camo, okay, I would say you want to be perpendicular because you don't want overspray everywhere. That way you can almost laser it into place. But again, that's something a little bit further on. But to do things like hairs and various things, you see artists putting hairs on a tiger's bum, that's because they're perpendicular into it, okay? Because it just makes it a lot sharper. But when you're talking about just laying down paint, uh, like we're doing here to have a smooth, you know, finish right the way through as a good preparation to moving on to your next levels. It doesn't have to be exactly spot on. The thing you don't want to be though is literally down on here. You've still always got to be, you know, between 90, I would say, and 45 degrees. If you go more than 45 degrees, you're wasting paint because you're not firing at the surface. It's going to hit, it's going to deflect, you're going to get vortex ring effect. So literally it's just coming back and you're recirculating that same paint particles. You're going to get texture and all the nasties. Okay, last thing just to show you, because amazingly we're doing really well on paint, okay, is just up in here. So wing roots and stuff like that, this is where you're going to get that nasty uh, sort of textured look. So what you want to do is that first pass, you're going to just be a lot closer. Okay, so we're just coming in and we're just doing that first one wet no matter what. Okay, so that goes up there. Then we're straight back down and just slowing down, nice and close, just watching it to see if it's turning wet. Okay, and then we're just increasing the paint. Okay, and then that way what happens is it's nice and wet, so all the little particles, even if they are doing a vortex and coming back on itself, and they're quite dry, they're going to hit that wet surface and they're going to melt into it. And then that way you won't get dried texture, but this is the trouble you can get under here especially, you're more prone to it even than you are on the top, but sometimes you can get the top of these areas of the wings here will be quite textured, the side of the fuselage can be textured, and that is just where the air is running around in that particular area, and it can just cause a little bit of, you know, sort of sandpaper effect, alright, a couple of things to easily get rid of it, first thing is just to sand it off with a very old, you know, sander or a polisher, and then after that if you really want to sort of do a little bit more work to it, then uh, obviously you can then pop in uh, with wet coats and things like that and try and melt it in but they're things that sort of can pop along uh, a little bit afterwards all right but generally just having a look now this wing is totally dry and this top's dry this is all very nice silky smooth no problem at all okay I'm really happy of how that's come out I'd have no problem now just moving on with the next color but color to be honest I wouldn't even care if that was the top coat because that's really really nice no problems at all with that Okay, so uh, what are we just saying down in here? Uh, what's the best, hold on, this is the trouble where it keeps moving around. Okay, uh, what's the best thing to do if you over flood the area? Okay, so if you do have that thing and suddenly you've got wet and you've got a run, as long as you physically haven't got, you know, the, the spider web effect where it's going absolutely everywhere, the easiest thing you can do is, if we just show you on this bit down in here, all right, so if you've come along, and you're putting down your paint and it's all going really, really well, okay, and you put it down, then all of a sudden it just goes really wet, okay, I don't know how well the camera can see this, we try and find a reflection today, there we go, there's one there, you see how wet that is, now that's borderline just about to be a, a real pain, okay, so what you want to do, just hold it there, don't change anything, we're just going to come along and this is just air, but we are probably now 10 centimetres away, and all we're going to do is blow down on it, and if I can catch that reflection again, where are you? Okay, and all we'll, this is just air onto this, and we're just very lightly blowing at it. And what it's going to do is dry it down. At the moment, it's going to put a skin on it. Okay, and then what will happen is, as it starts to dry, uh, it will then it will probably be more shiny than normal, but it will come back to you. Okay, that's drying back really, really nice. You see it drying off and flattening off. Okay, and it's just a case of waiting. Now, obviously you could walk away and leave it, but I'm speeding this up. Okay, so you can see now it's almost gone, almost gone, almost gone. There's a tiny mark in the middle, which I'm not overly convinced wasn't us. It could have been there before. But now it's down on there. We're happy with that. It's just going to come back and just going to dust over the top of it again. And what that will do is blend in that spot. So instead of it being a spot now, we can actually take it back. We're just going to work around the outside to show as if we've painted this area and then we can just go over it and we can disguise that huge wet spot is now hidden 
underneath one. Okay, if we just dry this back, and that's how you hide them. So you can just say, right, okay, walk away, move away, go somewhere else with it, and you'll be absolutely fine, or just do it like that. Just get them to go in. You see, you've got that wet spot coming back, but it will disappear down into there once this all dries, only because it's very wet. And as I say, if you're not happy, you just come in again, another little dusty coat, and you just knock it back and take care of it like that. Okay, so that's the thing with it. It's, it's just one of those things of knowing when it's going to do it though, and that is part of learning the hobby, learning the trade with this, is how far you can physically go before it starts to run, you know, which is obviously the worst case scenario you can have from a modeling point of view. You should never be near running, okay? You just want to be down, put it in. But a lot of the trouble with, what, with runs is over thinning the paint. You know, paint's quite thick, it's quite capable of gripping, but the thing is, as soon as you've got too much thinner in there, there's not enough to physically hold itself, and then it just falls off your model, okay? So from that point of view, finding that balance like we were showing, doing the test areas, making sure you've got the right mix is how you move on and go forward with this. But this is now all very nice, very smooth, there's no roughness on any of this at all, so no problem with that whatsoever, all right? Uh, right, okay, so... Uh, where were we to? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, how about using a prime, uh, a polished uh, surface? Uh, sorry, how about using a primer as a polishing surface uh, instead of polishing the plastic? Uh, I use the primer coat, black coat, polished. Uh, it does. Uh, you can do, yeah, absolutely, if you want to. As you say, it's personal choices on how you you really work your way through it a lot of you are talking about stuff that's more complicated than it needs to be okay this is really just trying to get the guys to get paint down and all the rest of it we're trying to keep it as simple as we can we will move on to the really you know nuts and bolts of it all a little bit later on um, if there's nothing on the surface like a wing uh, don't in particular if it's a cop fit it's like all the parts of the airbrush uh, what is the best thing to do for flood area we said? Uh, it will often self-level, don't touch it, which is basically what I do. Um, and then uh, very, very thin sandpaper or a polisher, or even, to be honest, an old t-shirt. You don't really need uh, something to be cutting into it. You're just trying to rub that very minute surface texture away. To be honest, an old t-shirt works just as well as a polisher for doing that type of work, okay? A polisher will then make it a very, very shiny, very slippery surface, and that's not what we want. We're after a silky smooth uh, paint finish rather than being uh, that one putting in there. Uh, uh, right, okay, so hi Phil, I find that Tamiya paints are very uh, delicate. Can you demonstrate this uh, on the case, especially if you're recommending using its primer? Again, people say it is, I don't. Uh, I don't have a problem with Tamiya's being delicate at all. You know, we've got it on this wing now, uh, pretty solid stuff. I would put it on par with anybody else's. I don't think it is. Again, depends on what thinners you're using. I'm using self-leveling thinners into it. It works lovely with it. But there again, if you're using it with, um, you know, Vallejo stuff like that, something different. I probably wouldn't use Vallejo as a primer because that is softer, okay? That's a far, far, um, say the right word for it, but it, it's not as sticky, okay? It's more water-based, if you like, from all of them, um, and it tends to be quite slippery, so it's hard to get down as a primer coat onto plastic surfaces. So I don't tend to use it from that. Also, from a handling point of view, you can rub through Tamiya, uh, yes, but compared to Vallejo, Vallejo you can rub through in half the time, so I really wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, what thinner are you using? Okay, so I'm using extra thin. Some of you guys say an X20A. Have you tried self-leveling thinners? Uh, a primer might help. Uh, basic zoom dogs. Right, okay. Wearing gloves. You can do, as I say, if you're using something like this, you don't have to and all the rest of it. So right, okay, that's putting that one on. So from a painting point of view and putting down paint again, just remember your speed. First couple of passes, you're going to be not hanging around, shall we say, 
when you're positive that the paint has got something to grip to, you can be what I call more positive with your paint brushing and literally coming down there, putting it down nice and slowly, just looking at it as it's going down, angle it so you can see the reflection. Okay, so don't do it in a dimly lit area. Good lighting, again, pretty much a must. You can see what's going on. Let the airbrush do all the work. It's laying down the paint. You're just keeping the constant movement right the way over. So if it's looking too wet, just move a little bit quicker. So that way you're putting down a thinner coat. So you don't be adjusting the trigger or anything else like that. You're happy with the flow. The airbrush is working correctly. It's not stopping, starting, there's no spitting. You're happy, don't change anything. You know, if that's what it's doing, and then just move away and move down the others, okay? So we just do a quick, very fast color change here. And we'll switch airbrushes for each of these, okay? So down in here, we'll get rid of this. And then what we'll show is it with other people's, okay? So we're just gonna do a dump and run in here. Uh, okay. Ooh, airbrush clean up. <clears throat> okay. And again, this is the other thing as well. Good practice, clean your airbrush out as soon as you finish doing all your bits and pieces with it, because that way the paint is nice and soft, it's not drying in your airbrush, you're not getting a skin forming, it's not drying to the side, that stops all those bits getting down into your thing. We got a little bit loose on the front, so we got some foaming action going on. Okay. So when you go straight through, you're just looking down into the business end of your airbrush, as I call it, the business end, the top, because that's where it goes down, and it's clean. Okay, there's no nasties floating around in there, so then you're good to go. Okay, and then usual thing, last bit of blowout, do down on your paper, nothing there, then you're good. Okay, so um, let's try in here okay so this is my uh, obviously the AL it's equivalent to an evolution okay so for this what we're going to do is just to show you uh, because this has got a bit of paint down here already so it gives something to grip to but we're going to talk about obviously using Vallejo Model Air okay now Vallejo Model Air it's great stuff they do say you can just come along with this stuff squirt it into your airbrush and you just spray it hmm not as straightforward as I think they'd have you believe, shall we say. Now this is the same bottles we used last week. So we've got a nut in here that we put in here. Okay, so we're just gonna give that a shake. So usual thing, as we can see on this end, we've got nasties, we've got this stuff, okay? And if this gets down to your paint, you know, it's like good night. Don't like using the spitty end, even though it's open. So what we're going to do is we're just gonna grab the top, pull it off, Okay, we're just going to come down in here and probably around about the same amount of paint. Okay, we just put the top back on. This back in. Okay, now this paint is naturally thicker. Okay, but it's a, it's a thinner mix overall than it would be if you were making it up with Tamiya. But I still maintain it needs a little bit of something just to make this work as appetised, shall we say. So, to be honest, the best thing you can do for this one is to use its own thinner. Okay, so this is the actual Vallejo airbrush thinner, but as you notice, we're not going to come in here. We're just going to put a few drops into it to generally get this thing going, okay? So we're not going to go in there with damn near gallons of this. Okay, good old mix. Okay, so straight into the colour cup. And we're watching as you pour the paint into the colour cup to make sure there's not a lump falls in or anything else goes in there with it. Okay, so usual thing again, we'll just check our flow. Pretty happy how that's coming out. Okay, so on this wing, to be honest, I'll grab it by the other side. Okay, exactly the same thing as we did before. Okay, so to start with, it's going to be all about the air coming in. And we're just putting down a very nice light coat right the way over and working down the edges. And just putting this one in. It's still funny spraying this stuff because it, it smells very nice, if anything. It's very floral, okay? Now to me, we just sand in a little bit like with too much air, okay? So we're just gonna pull the air back a little bit. 
and again we're just listening for it and then we're basically going to replace what we did but we're just going to watch it a lot more closely okay because this is pretty much a true type of acrylic and you can probably hear the difference because we've suddenly gone a little bit thicker paint than we had before so again we're just very lightly coming off we're probably around about a 45 degree angle there okay and we've got the paint going in so what we're going to do is just going to lightly run around and this time we're going to try something different we're going to put some circle type things in okay so it's quite nice again it's looking a little bit wet over in that side so we're going to move around okay but it's just taking your time and now we're getting a bit more paint going along you see how it's looking slightly wetter down there in the middle okay so you can say right all there that's dry it back looking too wet for my liking okay so we're just going to dry it back so now it's got quite a nice covering right over that wing okay so then we're going to come back in check our flow we're happy how that is and now we're just going to do exactly what we did with the other and just going to paint in the actual panels okay so we're just picking out to be honest individual type panels now and then as soon as they get a little bit wet we're just going to go off somewhere else but you can probably hear we're not using much air pressure we don't need to okay and we're just going to put down quite a wet looking coat now just to blend all this in okay so now this last coat we're just going to really wet the look And just taking your time and we're just overcoating and to be honest I'm starting to ease back on the trigger now because I feel more confident the paints gripping very nicely so I feel that yeah we can probably stick down a lot more paint than we have before because it can accept it We're just looking for a, a slight wet coat. Okay, and again, we're just going to do these flat. So that's a little bit wet down the back because there wasn't enough paint there to hold it. So what we're going to do, dry it back. Okay, and again, if you can see the paint being pushed, move your airbrush further away. Don't worry about your air pressure. Just dry it back. Get it right back there. And to be honest, we'll run this right the way over the wing. Just drying it back. Now the thing as well you notice with the Vallejo, because it is generally a, a, a more, as I say, it gets a bit confusing, but technically Vallejo is one of the better, shall we say, uh, acrylic based paints rather than the synthetic ones. So it can give you a little bit of uh, a longer drying time, purely because it is what it is, okay? And then again, looking across it, you should see we have, it's, it's drying at the moment, but as you can see it's nice, it's smooth. We've had no problems with it so we've got no marks in the actual paint now that is drying okay but it is going to take a little bit longer than we actually did with the tamiya side of things because the tamiya one it had the self-leveling thinners it's a lacquer based thinners it dries quicker okay and it will dry you know in a slightly sort of more uh, even fashion shall we say than you'll get over here now the drawback is you can't put technically lacquer thinners into this paint because it's a true uh, acrylic all right but you can see it's drying back no problems whatsoever okay so it is that thing it's just a case of taking your time moving through the motions of it uh, and that thing and when you spot that wetness when it's just looking really shiny before it starts to push your paint and you end up with a wall of it move off just go somewhere else never try and come back in and push the paint the other way if you've got a wet mark and it's pushed it so you've almost got, got like a, a wave effect don't think oh I'll go the other side and push it back 
just leave it. Literally, hopefully it will self-level. You've got enough wetness in there to allow that to happen. But that's beginning to dry off. That's still a little bit tacky. Again, that's the trouble with this. It does take a while. What you can do, and just so I don't go in, I'm just gonna hit the hairdryer and suck some of this out. This is just a warm setting. And this is cold. both those wings done just like that okay so they're both looking really really nice okay and uh, this guy is drying off and again although this is still slightly tacky it is still and you can probably see by the shininess of it very very smooth okay and again on the other one you can see this one because obviously it's in the gray uh, and that's what we're looking for you're just looking for a nice even smooth paint finish as you make your way through Okay, and that's the best thing you could ever hope for. Okay, it's a nice smooth paint flow. And to be honest, to start with, with your airbrushing, what you're just looking for is something as it just worked and it went well. And you walk away from it and think, oh, that worked out okay. So i.e. your airbrush isn't coughing, stopping and starting, and you can't get it right, or it's too wet, and it took wet, or it's too dry, and you've got texture. And hopefully that's what we've covered leading up to this. We've got rid of all those problems because we've dealt with those and we know what it's doing. So if you were in a situation where you were spraying this down and it just looks wet, then you just know you need to thicken up your paint mix. Okay, come back, put it into your colour cup, have a look at it. But again, throughout this entire thing, and I won't do it once, we won't talk about air pressures, percentages and mixes, because again, you're just listening for it, you're taking, you know, just the cues from the airbrush especially, if you're listening to it, and you can actually put down what the right amount of paint you're looking for, and the airbrush just sounds like it's singing. Okay, it's just a normal hiss. There's no crackle to it. There's no sort of spitting noises to it. If it's doing that, it's struggling, okay? So either it needs more air, uh, okay? And if it needs more air and you're happy with the amount of paint flow that's coming out, it means you need to thin it a little bit more, okay? So it is just that variable, just understanding what's going on, listening to your airbrush as you make your way through. The other thing that is to notice as well, when you are spraying your airbrush, if you've been spraying the first half and you've had no problem at all, yet the second half it starts to cough and spit and everything else like that, then it could be a case of perhaps a bigger job that you start to get drying up on the end of the needle, okay? So all you want to do is just keep a cotton bud handy, and I, you know, have done it in the past, but you could use your thinner to whatever you're using. Put a little bit down on your table, or you can have it in a bottle top or something where it's handy, and all you do is just pop a cotton bud into it and just wipe the tip. Okay, and sometimes what will happen is you will physically pull off a slither of paint where it's dried on the actual end of the needle. But the thing is, every time your needle retracts a little bit, it closes off your paint flow. So that's why you're getting stopping and starting. So sometimes if you're in really, really hot conditions, you can do that. Just keep it wiped away, keep it clean. The other thing as well is to come over every now and again, you're spraying it, it's going fine, blow full tilt on your airbrush. Because what actually happens is you pull that needle right the way back, all the paint's being pushed over, it blows all the crap off the end of your needle so it's clean. So when you come back in again, you're just going in there and put it down, all right? What you don't want to be doing though is having your airbrush really high like this, okay? A couple of things that are gonna happen. So when you're under here and you're trying to put this down, okay, and you're thinking, yeah, nice high air pressure because it'll dry at the same time, okay? So you're putting it down like this and you're thinking, yeah, that's all going great. Okay, we're gonna come in this corner up here. Okay, we can just flood this down. It's a nice high air pressure. Just doing it here. So we're covering all in one. Okay, 
Okay, so a couple of cues that are happening down in here. Okay, if we can catch it in the light, if you can, guys can see it. I don't know if you can see the ripple that's happening on the surface. Okay, now this is basically stage one orange peel. Okay, I don't know if you can just catch it like that. So what's actually happening is, is the paint is so thick on the surface of the actual model that it's being pushed downwards and it's drying. So it's actually getting a skin on it. So you're actually ending up with technically what I call stage one orange peel. But also you might see how lumpy and bumpy and gritty and dirty that is. This is also because it was hitting the side of this vortex ring. You've got the dried gritty stuff. It's coming back and it's being pushed into the surface. Okay, the other thing as well is down on the back here, if we can catch it in the light, if we can catch it in the light, come on, there we go. Okay, you catch it in the light, you see how we've got ribbons of it falling down the tail, down the flap, so you've actually got like waves coming down the flap, and again, what I call stage one orange peel, okay. Now, don't get me wrong, this does have its place. I can't think where, but it's the way I used to spray years ago, okay? And really, this is how I started off. I was very much a high air pressure, chucking it down, which is great, because you don't tend to get runs with it, okay? But what you do get is an awful surface. So when you look at it, okay, this is nice and glossy, and when it dries back, it'll be a lot better, but it's gonna have this or horrible orange peeling. And to be honest, it's got bits of it. I don't know how well it's showing up on camera, but I've got bits of fluff in here. I've got nasties and everything else. Yet, to be honest, when we did all of this, we cleaned it all. So we know there's physically nothing on it that was there before because it all had a full wipe down. What it's doing is that high air pressure is also picking up all the crap in the environment, okay? Because you've got such a bunch of air coming down here, you're causing a vacuum behind the airbrush. So as you're spraying at 30 PSI, okay, so you're coming in literally like this, it's blowing, you're sucking everything with it. So now it's drawing everything around it and blowing it in. When you're just doing it at a very low air pressure, it's not really pulling much in for the environment, but you are physically hoovering up everything and blowing it out the front that's being stuck to your model. So if you ever wondered again, why is it I get bits in here, it was perfect earlier, if you're at high air pressure, that's what can be happening. And this is starting to dry back. Your other risk is, that this will dry back really, really patchy um, because of the way that you put it down. Okay, so if you put it down a little bit too quick or, you know, you're in a situation where you're perhaps in a little bit of a hurry and you're just trying to finish it off and put that final coat down, uh, then it can give you a rough finish right over this. Okay, so as we dry this down, you can probably see the differences in the thicknesses. Okay, so if I try and catch this guy in the light again, Okay, if you look on that tail, I catch it somewhere there, on that flap on the back, you can see how it's got that ribbon. Now that's right the way through that, and that's going to stay there through every single coat as it makes its way on. But also, you can see we've got this uh, wet mark up here, okay, going through the motions of it. You can hear me all guys, shout if you can. Some of you got uh, lost sound, or is it just me, you know, squeaking? <laughs> okay, but generally, as you can see, it's just one of those things. It does work, but like down in here, I've got a really dark spot um, and everything. And also, you might notice up here where we've got, to be honest, it wasn't me, it was where the kids did it. I can not take the blame. They did a great job. But you can see there's a bit of a glue mark running down here. Thick paint will not hide bad paint work, uh, bad plastic work and all the rest of it, you still need to have that sort of layer perfection type thing. So you know if it's perfect in primer, it's perfect on the next level and make your way through, okay? So last up is your microfillers and stuff like that, okay? So <coughs> microfillers, they're great, don't hide anything. Just think of this as a primer. Don't think of it as actually getting rid or hiding or anything at all. So what should we do for this one? Should we do it in here? Let's pick another airbrush. So I'll be bad and I'm just going to tip that for a second. We'll clean him up in a minute. Okay. So this is the one stage trigger fits all type one. Okay. So in here, we're just going to pop in. And this is why I like this stuff because you can just shake the crap out of it and put it in here and away you go. Okay. Now, the only thing you find is you tend to flood with this. What I tend to do is if you've got one of these, just turn this all the way in to close it. Okay, so that's just all air now. And then as I pull back, we start to bring the paint in, okay? Then we just adjust our airflow to all the way off. I always go the wrong way with this, I don't know why. It's on backwards, you know. 
loosey loosey tighty tighty okay and again we're just looking for it on there and it doesn't look too bad at all that's roughly where we want to be I think a little bit more I think. okay so again obviously we were using all the different types of uh, paint brushes here and everything at our disposal okay so in here same thing very lightly okay just to start with now this is a, a sort of lacquer based one okay okay my air pressure is a little bit high so we're just going to knock that down just a little bit okay and then again it is the thing now I struggle using this type of airbrush purely because it's great for doing big things but little things I just can't feel it too much okay so again nice little quick movements always moving never staying in one place any longer than we have to okay so we're just literally jogging all the way around and you might hear the air pressure is very up and down it's because we're on the limit of what it can atomize so I'm gonna to have to go a little bit higher than I want to be uh, but this is the only trouble with this type of airbrush okay and now what we're going to do is because we've got a good coat on here we're literally going to come in now here i'm trying to keep it more 90 degrees so again nice and slow so we're just going to do up here And again, you don't have to do lines, you can do circles, but you just need to keep it even, okay? More important to be even on this than it is to be the style you're doing it. So as long as it's all the same, you'll be absolutely fine, okay? So just on here, we're just going to extend this down. And again, you're looking just to see where you are. Okay. I don't even know if that sits in there like that. It will do. Okay. And then the thing with this is, as you can see, it's dry instantly. Okay. And it's gone on there. And obviously, spraying white, as we know, is pretty much the nightmare of all nightmares. Okay. So, again, no problems with it at all it's down it's smooth and again the reason i like it it's dry this over here is wet absolutely wet i couldn't touch this because if i put my finger i'm dragging it literally over this on here we are now dry nice and smooth we're lovely and smooth on here but even this stuff still is just a little bit tacky i think if you was to hold it you know this here this wing and really give it some you know heat with through your hands and stuff you're going to put fingerprints in it so you do need to avoid it so this is probably going to take a good hour minimum to go off okay under here though this is our technically our normal tamiya side with lacquer thinners or our normal sort of you know hk uh, down here paint this is totally dry so again nice very easy to use no problems at all with it okay so again it's learning what works especially for you at the end of the day don't forget it's personal and all the rest of it that's why i don't use vallejo for priming all the rest of it vallejo paints we've used it hundreds of times in the builds probably 50 percent of every build i've done has had vallejo paints in it we like it it sprays very nicely you can do some very nice work with it but again you just need to let it to dry and all the rest of it as you go right the way through the motions of doing it okay so primers take your choice you know at the end of the day it's personal a lot of people would say well i can use the below because i don't spray till the following day i'll come back i might do it, it might be another week absolutely fine Steinal res stuff like that okay again if you're not going to be coming back to it for a week it's good stuff because you have no problem with it at all but if you want to come back to it quickly you know you might want to think about other things okay there's other options out there that do it really really well okay how are we doing on questions are we all good in there 
Steinel Res question. Yeah, did we not answer that one? Or do you want to know what Steinel Res is, uh, David? Um, uh, what would be a nice uh, if you could comment on lacquer banks primers uh, such as MRP's one? To be honest, don't forget this is exactly the same. I have got it, and I do use it, and I have no problem with it. Uh, to be honest, I have them all here. Uh, we've used them before, um, the MRP ones. They will work exactly the same as this one. There is no very, very little difference between the two. They go down just like the MRP paints. In a moment, we can have a go with one if you like, uh, and we'll do it that way. Usual thing with them though, again, do not flood the area. Minimum air pressure is what you need to paint with. You don't want to be going in there with too much uh, paint and everything else. And also, I don't know if you can see in there, we used absolutely zero paint whatsoever, okay? It, it goes for absolute miles. That's the thing. A lot of people think the lacquers, um, you know, it's, it's that thing that you'll just go through them and a bottle won't last five minutes. If you keep your air pressure really low, they go on for absolute ever. Okay, so usual thing, if I'm doing any type of hot product, shall we say, then it uses lacquer thinners just to clean it out because it will do the job absolutely lovely. Okay, let me just go down there. We just tip that initial one like we do before. And because it's lacquered through this, obviously we're putting a secondary one and then blow that through. So what we do, we just open up the back, open up the air pressure and dump it. Just dump the entire thing. Pump the trigger because obviously that clears the needle. And then what you're looking for is down in here to make sure that that's totally clean at the business end. Secondary one, you just put a drop back in here, okay, and then blow it all through down on here. Okay, and when you're down to hardly anything, that last bit, the last tiniest bit that comes out, you want it to be clean, okay? The other thing as well, a lot of people say about Q-tips or cotton buds and you can come down and clean out with them. You can, because obviously, look, we've still got crud down in there a bit, but just make sure you use a good quality one because the fibers can go down in there as well. And if the fibers go down in there, again, it gets next to your needle and the nozzle causes a gap, means it doesn't turn off. Also, you will cause wear and tear on your needle or your nozzle as you're doing all of that as well, okay? So, MRPs, things have been asked about it, we can do a quick job on this one. Now this, to be honest, this hairbrush has had horrible paint through it in the last couple of days because it's been doing some nasty jobs. So we're just going to put that through and we're just going to have a white round in here because I'll be honest with you, this had washed through it yesterday. Okay. As you can see, it's, yeah. Okay, so we're just going to put a little bit more in there and a wash out. Blow this through. Yeah, the AK primer I think is a lacquer. That's the thing with it. The thing is, again, um, lacquers, a lot of people say they really, really stink. They do. I am not going to lie, okay? But again, it is that thing. If you're very low air pressure, spraying the minimums you need to spray it, you don't necessarily get the smell you do as if you're absolutely blowing this stuff around all the time. Okay, if you're continuously blowing this stuff around and it's airborne, you're breathing it in, you can stink out the entire house. All right, now these, to be honest, uh, I'll tell you what, we put the black down so you can see it. Um, I think it will need a whiz with my little machine because this one hasn't been used in probably the last six months. So a good old mix up in there. A lot of people said when I did this one, like, how do you keep it clean? That's all I do. I've never done anything more to it and it, it doesn't gum up or get horrible or anything else like that. I just literally put it on a tissue and give it a whiz. So that's how I clean mine. Okay, so this stuff, I'm just hoping this is gonna work with my hairbrush because to be honest, we have um, haven't used uh, this airbrush to say I have wash in it yesterday. So I'm just a bit concerned it's still got wash in it. Okay, so first thing, air pressure right down, okay. 
get the air pressure level. Okay. So again, put it right down so you can hardly hear it. Struggling, looking speckly, sweet spot, probably about there. Okay. And then we'll go in. Okay, oh right, okay, where are we gonna put it? Okay, tail. You're it tail. Okay. So again, just So again, to start with, nice and light, nothing heavy. You're just putting down like a speckled dust type coat first, okay? That is just physically there to grip the paint, okay? Then, as soon as you've got a little bit on there, you can come along with your second coat, which covers. Okay, this is probably your nicer coat because it's physically going to cover the thing. This we've got to join down in here, so a lot closer than we normally do. I'm not saying flood it, but you're coming in a lot closer. Okay, you can probably see because it's a lot darker. Okay, and then literally back up. Okay, just down on this side area. Okay, so we're happy there's a lot down there now. So you could, if you want to do, cut to just air, dry it. Okay, so now we've got enough on there. What I'm going to do, we're just going to come in and we're going to work it in. Okay. Okay, so looking a little bit damp. Okay, and I said it doesn't have to be lines, it's however you want it to be. So you just literally line this all up. And the thicker you paint you get down there, the more you can layer it up. Okay. It will just sit down on there. But like we were saying at the beginning, you want it to have a look. So when you're putting it down, it's almost got a wet look. Because the wet look means it's got that time to dry. If it's dry, you're just going to be dry all the time, okay? So we can just work in this down. And again, we've got this corner, so what we're going to do is just going to flood that corner. Okay, and then just this last one up here. Okay, really nice, so then just going to speed this up, just going to dry this down. A little bit of movement there, which I'm not sure what even that is, but there's something there. I've got a feeling we've spat some thing out of here. Let me just get that to dry. Just dry that back. And there we go. That one's on there, just like that. Again, don't forget, we're not looking for gloss, but again, straight away, this stuff, we can touch it. And that's the beauty with this stuff. We can get right in there, put it down on there, okay? And then on here, a little bit touchy, a little bit tacky. I was caught it with my finger just there, a little bit quick, but it will go within the next couple of minutes, but it's almost instantly drying. See, I've put a fingerprint there now because I've overcooked it, okay? Where you get a bit carried away. But down here, totally dry, no problem at all. Over here, this is still wet, better bone dry absolutely fine okay so from that point of view as you can see works really very very well with the mole 
no problems at all. So your main paint that you're gonna come down and put this in is gonna basically be exactly the same. You're gonna follow exactly the same rules as we've done there because there is no difference. Priming, I think people tend to think, oh, it's just a coat of primer, just put down a quick coat of primer. You shouldn't, you should treat your primer like you would treat your paint because again, it will show through, okay? So the bit down in here, which you can, I don't know how well you can see it, but now it's looking a little bit nasty in some areas, shall we say, with all the little problems you can get when you try and speed this up. So this flap down the back, if we can get it to catch in the light. You can see that tide mark, there we go, on the flap just here, okay? That's going to be there through every single coat of paint you do. Yeah, that's dry, okay? The other thing as well, we've got quite a lot of texture up here. I can feel it, grittiness under my finger, okay? That's not going to go. This little wet ring down in here, yeah, that's nasty, but that's actually in the paint now, okay? So don't think just a quick coat will do because obviously on this flat, things like that, that's it, you're not gonna hide it because it's gonna show through every single coat you do. And especially if you get into those more sort of, you know, delicate paints, chromes, metal finishes, things like that, they are gonna be an absolute nightmare as you work your way through. So really just treat them, every coat, like it's your final coat right the way through. And I think that will enable you to have a little bit more forethought as it goes through, okay? Now, if you are in that position where you're putting it down and said and it's not looking particularly brilliant or you've got something else, then obviously you can hit it with a sanding stick, come in with it, but first of all, just try a lint-free cloth, okay? So an old T-shirt, something else like that. Just give it a light rub just to see what that will do because the thing is, as soon as you start coming in with like sponges and that and you wear through this delicate paint, then you're gonna end up with an area, you need to reprime it, then you can cause more trouble. So obviously, you get away with as less as you possibly can as you put this right the way through. But hopefully you can see at the front here, it's, it's drying out lovely. This back end's going in and we're gonna have no problem at all with any of it. So in some ways, that's the thing. It, there's no secret to it. A lot of it is, is just knowing what's going on with your airbrush, understanding your airbrush, making sure your airbrush is working how you want it to actually physically work, okay? If you're happy with the airbrush, the way it's working, don't adjust it, don't play with it. I'm a great believer in if it's not fixed, don't break it. If it's not broken, don't fix it, okay? So just work through any issues you've got, listening to your airbrush. If you've got a thing where your airbrush is crackling and it just doesn't seem right, and on your paper and it's just not happening, don't put it near your model, dump it, start again with your paint, okay? Just get rid of the lot of it, start afresh. It's not worth, you know, worried about 30 P's worth of paint when it's gonna be bucket up your model uh, and gonna give you trouble as you make your way through. Right, okay, uh, Hatagawa paints. I'll tell you what, I've never used them. I can't, you know, honestly think they're massively different to anybody else's acrylics. Okay, Neil, uh, how do you stop wasting paint? I say you tip your paint into the cup uh, almost at random without any sort of uh, pip, uh, pipette, um, or is it just experience? Again, it, it is that thing. Um, I would always recommend having more paint than not purely because we've all been in that situation where you've made up a batch and you just haven't got enough to finish that final wing. That's not only bloody annoying, it can be a nightmare to try and color match it if you've just added a few drops of something. So I'm a great believer in have too much. And then if I've got too much, I will tip it back into whatever the closest color was. So if I made something like XF19, we were doing some type of gray and I just added a bit of buff, chances are I just chuck it back in because for the sake of it, it's not gonna worry anything. It's not gonna change anybody's color. It's not gonna make a huge difference to anything, okay? So I will pop it all back in. But again, it's one of those things. Don't worry so much about pets and five mils and things, because in here, everything changes on a daily basis. The studio lights, incredible amount of light, ultraviolet light, which dries everything pretty much instantly. The computer running over there has got its own built-in radiator, for God's sake, for cooling and everything else. Not to mention windows around here, we're south-facing here, so we get the sun all day long. Things are always changing, okay? And because of that, I just gently adjust things. And that's what we're saying about here. Having things like a Mac valve, instead of dialing in 22 PSI, 22 PSI? Okay, I might go from something from 15 PSI spraying down to 10 over the course of the day because things are just slightly changing. Also, like we said about last week, you paint in your color cup, it can actually get thinner the nearer you get to the top. The heavier pigments begin to settle, so if you're doing a big paint job, it can take a little bit more air on the fly as you're doing it. So if you can just slightly add a little bit more air as you're making your way along, that can be a great little help as well. So it's just the tiny little adjustments and it could be this thing classic example me and Hans 
our spraying styles are totally different. Me and Steve's are totally different, but we all sort of, you know, do say the same thing is that it's just finding the sweet spot with your airbrushing. You just find that pressure that works for you, but it's what's working for you on that day because no two paint mixes are ever going to be the same. Okay. No two weather environments are ever going to be the same. So the variable is what you're doing with your airbrush and your thinner. Okay, because then that way you can actually then just add a touch more thinner, knock back the air pressure a little bit, perhaps thicken the paint a little bit, add a little bit more air, things like that. And that is one of the biggest keys to airbrushing. And it is, like I've been saying all the way through this, and I'll be saying it on the last day we do this, it's knowing, it's the knowledge. It's just that thing of thinking, this is happening, and without having to overthink the idea, you're just going to up your air pressure. And it will just be a tiny little fraction of a turn if you're using a Mac valve, okay? Or just a tiny little bit on your regulator just to bring it up that little bit. And that can be the difference between stopping and starting and spitting and sputtering to actually having a really nice airbrushing session where your airbrushes just work beautifully and everything else like that. And to be honest, that's one of the biggest light bulb moments I had many years ago when I went through that thing of every time I went to do some airbrushing, it was a torture test because you just knew it wasn't gonna be fun. There was gonna be some problem. The airbrush wouldn't work to start with and it was too wet or it was too dry or it came out like sandpaper. And it was just all those frustrations that actually didn't, I didn't want to airbrush. In fact, at one point I did go back to using a hairy stick and do a brush purely because I just couldn't work it out. Okay, so hopefully by me explaining exactly what we're doing and the reasons we're doing it, just gives you that little bit of knowledge uh, of just knowing it. Okay, and again, it's not going to be that thing that Phil says it's 22 psi, it will be you saying it just sounds a little bit crackly, so I'm just going to up the air pressure. So it's nothing to do with anything I've said or anything I've written down or a ratio or a formula, it's you using your airbrush and just adjusting all those little tiny things, trimming out your airbrush from an, being an aviation term. Basically, that's all you're doing, just making tiny little uh, areas to make the balance perfect and if you've got the balance perfect it can make or break if you're doing something like you know we're going to be coming up doing this guy soon this camo i know probably 50 percent of people will never build this model because they don't want to do that camo purely because to set up your airbrush to get it to do all of that and enjoy it is a little bit of a nightmare but when your airbrush is running well and you sit down and you just spend an hour and do that technique with it and it comes out perfect and you've got no splotches, there's no spitting, it's just worked beautifully. It's probably one of the most satisfying airbrushing type things you can ever do. Worm um, camo patterns on the German stuff as well, where it's got the squigglies all over the entire bodywork. You need to know your airbrush. You need to have great confidence in your airbrush. So that bit where you're just doing this and you're working your way around is that you're doing it because at some point, it might stop, but you know it won't because there's no reason it should. Why should it stop? It's good good paint mix, good airflow, everything's running well. But even if you notice it's starting to go a little bit awry, just being able to do a couple of little tweaks to your airbrush on the fly as you're doing it makes all the difference between a very happy airbrushing experience and one that has absolutely been a complete ball ache and you never want to see it again. So hopefully it will just give you that sort of bit of knowledge into it all. Right, uh, right, okay, so what are we saying down here? Uh, uh, it's got to be better than Floquil. To be honest, I used to use Floquil a lot for various other projects I used to do. Uh, the trouble you find with Floquil is, is that it's better for doing bigger jobs than the little tiny jobs. Um, it, it, it's not a nice paint to work with, it's like working with almost emulsion. Uh, it, when it's working, it's working lovely, but the paint itself isn't like modern paints which are uh, easily mixed and things like that. If the mix is good, it just transfers right the way through to your airbrushing experience. Uh, MLPs need a lot more layers than Tamiya and Vallejo Wright. Not necessarily, it depends again how you're putting it down. When you're working with MRPs, especially when you've got your primer down, it's lots of little light layers because the thing is MRP paints dry extremely quick. And when we say extremely quick, we almost mean instantly. So the great thing is you can just go back over it time and time again. But the great thing I think with MRPs is you can be so close and so little air pressure, you can put in a lot smaller little areas. So it might look like you're going over it a lot more. It is just that thing. Their primer, I don't think is as good as, shall we say, as their actual paint. Their paint is very, very good because you can put down a solid line of color uh, whereas with others you'd have to do two or three other ones purely because it dries really really quickly as you're putting it down so you can almost go quite slowly with it and draw it down uh, MRP paints I think are probably one of the most misunderstood paints out there 
purely because, and I was exactly the same first time I used it, too much air, too far away, uh, and didn't understand what I was really doing with it. When I did that SU-27, I could be hands up, I did a horrible job on that one. It worked, but I did it as I was using Tamiya or Vallejo. Now I understand that paint better, I could do a lot, lot better job with it. Okay, so from that point of view, you will just be using a quarter of the paint I used last night. To be honest, the A10, classic example, you think how big the A10 was, I probably used the same amount doing that A10 as what I did doing that uh, 70 second flanker. You know, so you know, from that point of view, it, it is, it's just understanding, learning it. But again, that was me, I wasn't listening. When I listened to it back, you can hear the air coming out of it. It sounds like I'm on the end of a pressure washer, okay? It doesn't need that much air. You can be a lot closer. And as soon as you get that cone effect we're talking, end of your airbrush, it's doing this. If you're too far away, this is very light and dusty and not doing really anything at all, okay? You get in closer, the cone comes in, it's a tighter pattern, there's more paint, and it's being focused and it's all on the surface of your model instead of going in the air okay so from that point of view again it's like we're saying with smell if you're too high air pressure and you're stinking out the room you are it's it's you go in airborne with it or you're wasting a lot of it it should be more focused straight onto your model and that's where you want 99% of that paint to go you don't want any of it to really go airborne if you can help it uh, uh, couldn't smell as bad as the flow quill that you used to spray. Yeah, smelly stuff. Can you even still buy it? I don't know if it's available. You certainly can't get it over here anymore. Um, being called away. Thanks for spending an evening teaching us newbies uh, week after week. It's much appreciate it. No problem, Neil. Great. Have a lovely evening. Okay, so down in the questions. Uh, Jimmy says, I'll tell you what, let me refresh. Okay, so uh, Jimmy says, I used to use an airbrush hose that feels like it's cloth covered, uh, but I've seen you using clear ones. In your opinion, which type of hope is best and why? Right, I have got both. Uh, we spoke about this the other day. I've got some really long braided ones and I've got some little short ones uh, and everything that comes in between, all right? So from my point of view, I like the clear ones so I can see what's coming up the airbrush primary reason so if I get water coming out of my air tank I know you shouldn't but we all do occasionally okay you can see it coming up and I, more than probably uh, times than I'd like to ever admit to I've been airbrushing and because you're physically on the end of your airbrush you're coming in like this and I can see it you can physically see the water droplets coming up so you can stop instantly and say right okay need to stop that something's gone wrong we can blow it out, take care of it, and all the rest of it. Downside to these, oh sorry, the other plus as well is you can get this any length you want. So one of these, at some point, I had about 22 foot on it, because I needed it in another room. Uh, and my, to be honest, it was when my children were extremely young, uh, and the airbrush was very noisy. So I used to have it in a completely the other end of the house, and used to run a very long hose. Not practical, because the thing is you lose air pressure by it stretching. And there's a good example of that just here. You might be able to see the difference between the neck and the body, you see how this is actually ballooned out? I have something to show it on, so you can see where it is ballooning out on the neck here. Um, that is the trouble. So this is physically stretching. So if I release air pressure from this, it goes down. So what tends to happen is with these types here, after a couple of years, like this is now, it's getting towards the end of it, it begins to physically stretch. So it's actually giving you artificial air pressure. So as you draw air pressure out of this and you take some of the pressure, it contracts and then the compressor kicks in and you might hear my compressor sometimes, you can hear it seems like it's getting stronger. That's because it's backfilling physically the hose and it's treating the hose like an air tank. Okay, so it's not exactly brilliant for it. The cloth ones tend to have a similar interior, shall we say, uh, but it tends to be a bit more stronger uh, heavier duty gauge stuff. This is a little bit more like a fish tank pump hose, if you call it. Although it is actually made by, you can see it on there, Harder and Steenbeck. So it is their own legit one. I bought a 50 meter roll of it years ago uh, and did it like that. But again, if you've got it, don't rush out and just to buy one. Um, chances are you don't need to use it. Okay. The only ones I really dislike not horribly but i don't like at all is the curly ones because they get caught up absolutely everywhere and they do my head in purely because it's like it's pulling on you as well it's like a giant spring so it's always pulling on your hand and all the rest of it you also want something that's lightweight so this is a lot lighter i suppose than the cloth ones are but probably being a little bit picky then 
Uh, right, uh, Mark says, hi Phil, uh, I have the Hiawatha Neo airbrush which is currently uh, have a slight problem with it continues to blow air out once I release the trigger. I've stripped it down and cleaned it but still the same problem. Right, have you checked that the, I think we can get this apart today, what happens is on these, these have these really really long nozzle stems here. This little o-ring Okay, put some lube around that and make sure it's really free. So when you push this up and down, it does feel like a cheap spring because it's a cheaper airbrush, admittedly, but you want it to be nice and free, okay? The other thing as well, when you screw it up into the body, okay, so you come in like this, don't over tighten it, okay? Because if you over tighten it, what you're actually doing is, this is just being rammed up that tiny little bit higher. But theoretically, if it's running on, it's just this bit. So actually what you can do, and do this as a small experiment. If we plug this in here, wait for it. Okay, so you can see the hole just here. You want to check it like this, just pull it out. And if this is just doing this and it's turning off, then it's no problem at all. Okay, if you've got it and it, you're doing it and it's running on, you just know it's this little bit here. There is a couple of little things you can do. I don't know if I can get mine off, but we spoke about this on the other one. It is going to do it. Okay, down in here, obviously it's a sealed unit. It doesn't completely unscrew like the other one, which I've just noticed. Okay, so I don't actually know how you'd get down into that then, because there are ones on the HS is just lift off. Uh, but what I would recommend is perhaps trying a little bit of lube just down in there, making sure you're clear up in here, okay, and in the top. But you just want to make sure this is nice and springy and it's not catching. But it is, if you over tighten it, what happens is this rams up, then this little O ring at the top here, what can happen is it gets crushed like a donut between the actual body of the airbrush and the bottom bit, and it pinches on this bit just here, okay. So it can cause a little bit of, um, you know, sort of friction against it and that's what makes the air run on and it's just the same for all airbrushes you can have that small little bit of trouble with it so when you do it up to start with just do it really loose okay so when you come in from here and you do this little guy up okay just pop your air thing in here and this is loose okay you will feel the air coming out the bottom but as you tighten it up there we go it stops Okay, and just work it out, just tighten it just loose and tight and just find the sweet spot. And you might find when you get to the top and you start to get right up there, that's when it carries on, then just back it off a little bit and you might be good to go. Okay. So hopefully that will get you going. Uh, right, do I need to buy a new seal? Yeah, try those bits first. Okay, just see how that goes on. If it is, it's just going to be that O-ring at the top that maybe um, it's just donutted out just a little bit. Uh, Paul says, hi Phil, uh, I've got, sorry, has Paul just left? Oh no, it was Neil. Uh, he says, hi Phil, I've got uh, some old uh, Hatagawa paints. Uh, they seem uh, very similar to the model Air Vallejos. However, uh, I've had a nightmare trying to thin them down. Self-leveling thinners uh, and X20A just turn it into glue. Any suggestions? Uh, to be honest, uh, I've not tried it straight out of the bottle. Walked away from the bench. Um, after stripping the airbrush twice uh, and doing tests. Cheers, and no, we do, thanks. Right, okay, so um, the thing with that is, uh, yeah, to be honest, this is a conversation I had with somebody only a couple of weeks ago, and I can't remember who it was. If it was you I had the conversation with, I do apologize. They were saying how, because uh, I tried their paints a couple of years ago, didn't really like them, um, you know, I, I, was, I, needed a, I borrowed them some, from somebody, to be honest, and just had a quick squirt, and they just, I don't know, it was just horrible. Um, yeah, it was like life color in it. Uh, so anyway, I decided, in my opinion, wisdom, they were crap, uh, and I wasn't going to touch them ever again. That said, whoever I was, I was speaking to, again, apologies, has told me that actually the chances are they might have changed their formula because he's been using them now, and they are absolutely great stuff. So it may be the old is not as good as the new. So maybe they changed the formula, and let's face it, Vallejo do it almost annually uh, and do different things to theirs, and they seem to improve and get better. But the thing to remember about those paints is they are a true acrylic. You can't actually put lacquer-based paints such as you know X20A. It's a form of lacquer into it. It's an alcohol-based, if you like. Um, 
uh, one like IPA. Uh, they don't like it, they turn to chewing gum and bubble gum and all the rest of it. So distilled water, try with those, or try a, a dedicated um, uh, acrylic. Uh, to be honest, have I got mine here? There's another one I, I, I have actually, yeah, I'm pretty good. Um, like this stuff here, this is a Tallery's own thinner. It's like milk, it's the weirdest stuff you've ever used, but it's great for doing true acrylics. It's no good doing Tamiya and all the rest of it, they don't like it. But uh, a tallery paint, if you ever use the tallery paint, you'll know that they don't like anything lacquer based either. They're weird stuff. Uh, but they're thin, as I say, it's like milkless stuff. Uh, it's white, uh, works absolutely wonders. So maybe just trying some different thinners. Distilled water even can work quite well with these paints. I know a lot of people who use life color swear by uh, distilled water. They say it works absolutely beautiful with it. So it might be worth giving that a whirl and seeing how you get on with those. Uh, right, any other questions? No, nope, we're okay in there today. Right, anybody in the chat got any questions? Uh, sorry, so David says it's no longer available from testers. Are we talking Floquil? Um, you still, I did, I did, I still, we can have some of them in here. Uh, no, I don't think I have actually. These are my really old stuff. I've got a load of the old polyscale stuff, does that count? Um, the thing is, with all airbrushing, there's a couple of things that I highly recommend. One is if you find a brand of paint that works for you and it works for your style of airbrushing, do not do the usual thing like a lot of people do and say, oh, there's a brand new brand of paint out there. It's got to be the newest and best and go out and buy it in bulk loads, okay? Buy a bottle, have a go with it. If it works well with you, then perhaps you know, think about extending your range. But don't be swept up with it and buying the big sets and everything else, because me personally, I've been caught like that over the years with pretty much everybody's paints. Certain people's paints I don't get on with. Okay, MIG paints, not really, okay? AK's paints, honestly, not as good as Vallejo, although a lot of people say they're the same. No, they're not, okay? But again, it's the style of the airbrusher you are. There's nothing wrong with MIG paints. If you like painting like, you know, with MIG paints, they're a lot thinner. They need three or four coats just to build up that color, where my stuff, you tend to do one or two. So from that point of view, it's just learning it, understanding it. It's just different ways of using a similar product, but it's not the same product. So don't be put into this thing where, because it comes in a 15 mil dropper bottle, um, they are all the same, because obviously the Hattagawa paints come in one of these. You obviously get the, you know, uh, the Vallejo ones, the AK Interactive, the MIG. It's a standard size bottle. Every, oh, they all come out the same factory. No, they don't. They are completely separate. It's just, it's a generic, uh, European bottle system for these. That's the thing with them, okay? And to be honest, um, I must give um, Had to Go Out Paints another go because they do seem to be uh, getting their act together. Some of the ranges they're bringing out as well that are very interesting, uh, very straight, you know, good range of colors in a set. So if you wanted to do a particular aircraft you've never done before, you could get the entire set. But again, just try a bottle, see how you get on with it before you actually go through and spend a lot of money and everything else because otherwise you can be tied into it. The reason I took on the MRP range so much is I did try a couple of bottles, to be honest, I did just those Russian ones. It really works well and the more I use it, the more I like it. Okay, so from my point of view, I'm switching that way, but I still love Vallejo paints. Vallejo paints, they're just so easy to use. And the great thing about them is, if you're in a situation where you're doing armor and stuff like that, they're beautiful to weather with because you can just sand them back. You can do great chipping things with them. It's a nice soft paint. Whereas if you're trying to do it with MRPs and stuff like that, they're quite tough and they tend to hold on to the actual paint a lot more and don't give it up as much as the others. Um, right, so Ben says, any tips on getting good coverage uh, with a very translucent colour like yellow and red without ending up with a really thick layer? Are some raw, uh, reds, yellows better than others? Okay, secret to that one is, is a white coat first. Okay, flat white or a satin white down first will save you tons of heartache. Okay, the trouble with it is, if you're using like translucent colours, you say reds, yellows, things like that, is that you've got to build up so much pigment into it to give it a solid look, okay? So if you can give it a little bit of a helping hand, then ideal, okay? So from my point of view, what have we done recently? The, you just thinking, wingtips on the uh, Helix. They are day glow, okay? The day glow color that we used was one of the Vallejo ones, which is a, down the back there, I can't reach it. Um, it's going to take a hundred layers to put that on. It's quite thin stuff, it's quite watery uh, in comparison. So again, white first, 
and then put day glow on top and it just pops because what it actually does you don't have to cover the entire thing what you can actually do though is get the reflectivity of the white underneath it to work with you so again if you're using red I would suggest putting white down first because it is just a really good color to reflect back that paint the same goes with yellow the other thing as well there's a couple of tips you can do to get it done quicker and that is to put down a very thick coat of paint first and when we say thick we don't mean thick as in thickness of the paint we mean the color mix so if you're using white for instance I put down a very thick coat of white first and then I will go over it with a very thin one to melt it in to get a more satin look so that way you get better coverage so you could do that with it as well to be honest that's how we did the yellows if I remember rightly I sprayed it on neat second coat went in like a 70% thinner 30% paint nice wet coat that it's self level good to go no problem at all and again, it depends if you're doing it for weathering point of view, if you're using it on armour or so it's really heavy weather like Gundam, stuff like that, then you know from that point of view you could probably put down a really thick coat so then that way you can do distress the paintwork afterwards but you need a lot of paint down there to help that out. So one thick coat is better than doing 30 very thin ones because you end up with three times the depth you know, and really you haven't got as much coverage as you had before. So from that point of view that's definitely the way I would go with it. So, any more questions, guys? Any more, any more, any more? Are we all happy in there? See, the chat's working well. How many of you are in there today? Got quite a lot of you in there today. Great to see you all. Uh, let me just check over in here. We are all good in there. Okay, let me just check up here. Uh, making sure we're all good everywhere, just in case someone has popped it in the wrong area. Uh, I don't I think we're all okay. Let me just bounce that back. So what we'll do uh, next time, uh, we're going to talk about obviously because technically what I've done is I cheated. We've used priming under the same thing as putting down paint because in my world it's exactly the same thing. Okay, so it doesn't matter how you prime or how you lay down paint. And what I will do after the show, um, I will take some high res decent shots of this with the lights all on uh, of these so you can see them. Okay, uh, and see exactly what we got down here tonight. I won't cheat, honest. Okay, so from that point of view, you can see how well Tamiya, to be honest, I'm looking at all three of these and I'm thinking. You know, if I had to put money on it, honestly, you know, I would probably say this Tamiya is gorgeous and beautiful, as you can probably see. It is just so easy to use, that's why I love it. Then I'd have to say this stuff over here, which is the MRP stuff, is gone down absolutely beautiful. But there's a pattern forming here because it's lacquer based, you see. Uh, and then when you look on the others, you can see that the Vallejo has gone down lovely. It's no problem, but I'll go back against it. Okay, under here was our joke one. And this in here has gone down lovely and smooth. Maybe a little bit of texture, if I'm honest, just up in here. Okay, but generally really nice and smooth. Uh, very nice indeed. But I will get some high raises of them, so don't panic. Uh, treat yourself to an early night. I have had a few late ones this week. Uh, if you use Tamiya, um, sorry, if you use Tamiya in your airbrush before you start using Valerio, uh, Valerio, uh, Vallejo, uh, can the Vallejo clog it up? I tend to blow right the way through. Uh, Colour quick changes, we can do them here actually, so we've got a bit of time. Uh, just to clear these up. When you're coming in, like I said before, I'm a great believer in doing the, uh, the dump system okay it's again it's one of those things that I've sort of self-taught uh, but it helps out because if you look in here now you can see how it's dried in here you see we've got a ring effect going down in there get one of the lights you see we've got little rings and various things in there so really what we want to do is lose that out there okay so I put in a little bit of lacquer thinners Okay, come along with the, my favourite old brush. Okay, we give this a rub around, but what you're doing literally when you're rub it, rubbing this around is some ways you're just peeling it off the edge. It's not melting it as such. Okay, so we just go right the way around the edge, down in the business end, give it a, a swizzle, as I call it. Okay, bring it up. Okay, and then what I do is I tip it. And then you can probably see it in there. You, I don't know how well you can actually see these white flecks in here. There's one big one right there, okay? But if you look around here, you can probably see as this dries out a little bit, you can see the little white flecks in there, okay? 
So the thing is, if that gets down to your business end of your needle and nozzle, okay, all it's gonna do is cause trouble. So if you can blow it out through the back, it's fine. And again, just on the ring here, if you can see it, there's a lump. It's physically sat there. So that's why I do this bit, okay? And we just give it a, a general go like that, okay? Once we've done that one, I'll put this here to save me cutting that melting, okay? Then we come back in with another go. Okay, and then this one, we actually blow it out into here. And you can see the color. And you pump the trigger and you see these spots that are firing out. That means it's not clean, because what it's actually doing is there's bits running around the nozzle. There we go, you see that? That is a good example. That guy is just flicked out there, okay? So that's really what you want to make sure does not stay in your airbrush. If that lump then had stayed in my airbrush, to be honest, tomorrow I would have probably had a jam needle if I left it in, all right? So then you come in, again, this is another, just a drop of lacquer thinners. You're only probably using half a mil. Okay, so we just flip this over again. Okay, again, still dirt. I put this in angle so you can see it. You see these, dirt, dirt, dirt. Pumping the trigger. Okay, I'm just pumping the trigger and then now we're getting there. You see it did those coffee bits and nothing came out, okay? So what I do is we clean the needle, give it a pinch. We know we're good. And then to be honest, I'll come in here with airbrush cleaner. So this is just uh, it's airbrush thinner. Where's my airbrush cleaner? Here we go. Okay, and this is the final one. And then this just goes in, even though this has got lacquers, I had lacquers through it. I still prefer this as my last pass, just because I think it's nicer. And again, as you're blowing, you're looking for little bits and I'm still getting tiny little flecks, just like this, just coming out. That's pretty good actually, okay? And that's clear. Also the thing is, the trigger always remains really sharp and springy and you should have no problem at all with it, all right? So the thing is, if, you, if you're letting go and your trigger sort of going through really slowly, it's getting caught probably in the nozzle and trouble pushing through the crud. Okay, so you just need to blow that through. So technically, when you get to the bit where you take your needle out, hopefully, if you can see, see so you've got a hole. We've got daylight right through the end. So there's no even bits in there. There's no, no water in there. It is just clear hole. I think you can see down the end. I could see it briefly at the beginning when we first did it. Uh, but it really is total daylight right the way through. Okay, so that way you know it's nice and clean and everything else. Now, if you wanted to, you could slip the needle out which isn't a bad idea. So all you do is take the needle out, okay? Give it a wipe, and then keep your needle somewhere separate to your airbrush, okay? If you keep it separate completely to your airbrush, okay? And then when you come in for the next time you want to use it, you can just pop it in, okay? Slide it in, we said before, just a little tap. Screw it in, that goes on. And you're just looking for total springiness in the trigger. You just want it to be that sharp, stabby, springy type effect. If it's dragging and slow, there's stuff in here that's slowing it down, okay? So again, you could put some needle juice or some, you know, super lube, things like that in there, and then you'll be good to go, all right? So you can just literally, but you're looking for that snappiness in the trigger all the way down. Are you going to cover, uh, sorry, are you going to cover off uh, clear coating? Uh, are we gonna talk about it? Yes, we are, definitely. We're going to be talking about clears, uh, glosses and things. What we'll do is next week, um, we're going to basically do camo work. So we're going to talk about a standard World War II camo of like green and brown or green and grey or whatever it is. And he'll get a coat of it, okay? And we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about obviously putting in post shading into it. So lightening up centres of panels, talking about that, talking about mixtures, air pressures, how to do it uh, in depth about that. And then what we'll do is we'll talk about obviously doing post weathering after that, the more intricate stuff, you know, post panel lines, all those types of things into it. Then we'll go into the things about actually going through metal coats, you know, obviously all the different types of things with that, your actual, you know, from high gloss chromes through to like distressed metals, okay? And then after that, we do about clear coating, okay? So it's in a, a sort of a formula to make our way through. So we talk about obviously high gloss, satin finishes and obviously dead flats and things which are pretty straightforward but again it's it's different ways of doing different ones with different products so we'll hopefully cover all of those um right uh sorry renee says i'm asking because i have uh one three-year-old uh, vallejo paint that tends to clog up uh over and over again 
can't get continuous nice airflow with it. Could it be something to do with the paint itself? Yeah, yeah to be honest, I'm a great believer in once you open a paint, they have a shelf life. Um, you know, let's face it, you know, once you open it, you're gonna get dry bits going in there and various things. So personally, it could be just the thing of, look, I don't know how much is a bottle of Vallejo these days, two quid. Might be easier just to replace it. The other thing, of course, you can do, um, I haven't got it here anymore. To be honest, I don't know what I've done with it because I haven't had to do it for a long, long time. But, hold on, hold on, hold on. I just had a brainwave. I thought I knew where it was. Uh, perhaps not. Have I not got it still? And if not, what would I have done with it? No, I obviously not You might remember I had one of these cut at the top, plastic bowl, always. And then at the bottom, used to put the old piece of like uh, tight material, stocking material, ladies pantyhose things underneath, stretch it across. The only thing you could physically do, mix the bejesus out of that stuff and then filter it and just see if that cures it. Because sometimes it really does help. Classic example is that I always used to struggle with and probably will do to the day I die, but is with uh, extra acrylic paints. Find when it's brand new, that first time you open that lid, it sprays beautifully. Second time you do it, and it doesn't matter if it's next week, 10 years down the road, it's a bugger. And what it is, it's a polyurethane paint. So what actually, it dries inside on the edges. And if you happen to give it a mix, perhaps with a brush, or you shake it up too much, and some of this gets free, it bungs up your airbrush and it is stop start, stop start all the way through. So with their paints, I always filter it. Now you can go out and buy the custom ones, but you don't need to. So literally just have it, a uh, little bit of pantyhose under there or you know stocking material, things like that. And then you can literally just filter it and you'd be amazed the crap that comes out of that stuff. Okay, because again, tiniest little thing can cause the biggest problems with your airbrushing. And normally it is, if I'm honest, those tiny little specks are what drive you mad because there's what caused the stopping and starting uh, and all those little issues you can have, all right? So from that point of view, personally, bin it and buy a new bottle. <laughs> you know, I know some people say, well, it's easy for you to say, but honestly, think about your own sanity. For the sake of two quid, could be the way to go. Okay, um, but you'll try a way of cleaning it with, uh, uh, brushes, lacquers and thinners. If you've got it clogged up in your airbrush um, and you're into that situation where it is really clogged, I highly recommend stripping the bloody thing down because what happens is you can be doing this thing of, um, you know, if we show it on one of these. Um, if you're just coming in, which is, oh, this one had uh, acrylic in it. Um, if you're blown away with your airbrush, okay, and yet you, you've been painting and you're all happy with it and we're just dumping this out to be honest okay and then you're into this thing when you're trying to pump the trigger to get it to go through all you're doing really is compacting the paint down in this far end if it's not coming out it's not doing it so every time you jab this thing and you're trying to get this to come through it's just not going to have it okay so i'm a great believer in saying right okay fair enough you know i can admit defeat okay let me just wipe this away <clears throat> and then just open up your airbrush, okay? And because it's compact in, you don't want to be dragging anything out the back, all right? So, one of the few occasions, front comes off, nozzle out, needle, push it forward, okay? And take it out. So you want to give this a wipe off because, because you've dragged it through, as you can see, it is completely covered top to bottom in paint, okay? So you really want to make sure you're not putting that back in afterwards okay then once you've got this through blow it through okay but you've got all paint in here and all the nasty bits so what I do say is obviously I'm going to use uh, airbrush cleaner okay so I've got my finger over the end fill it up okay give this a white round okay now this won't matter if you drop it through because it's not going into the nozzle Okay, so you can just give that a bit of white like that and then tip it all through. And I don't know if you can see it in there, but there's bits in there, quite big bits as well. Actually, as this begins to dry, hopefully the camera's going to pick that up. If not, I'm going to zoom in and show you because that's a good example of... It's always amazing you can't find the, the gears when you need one. There we go. Right, okay, so... Can you see all this? So these black bits are, could be what cause you no end of trouble down in your actual airbrush. Okay, so from that point of view, these are the nightmare bits. This has all come out of this airbrush. 
okay? So in some ways, giving it a good old flush like that can help the system just a little bit, okay? So then what we'll do, just blow that through, and then we'll just come in again, refill, brush, because the brush now can get right down past where the needle would sit. Good old mix round, dump that, and again, look at that, that's actually coming out of my airbrush, I can't believe that's actually coming out of my airbrush. Thought we got some that, okay? In the end, now if you're really good, you would have got a brush set for it as well, but that's assuming you haven't, okay? Okay, one last quick flush, just tipping it out the end, coming through pretty clear. So then we're just going to give this a generally a good wipe over right the way through. If you can, whip your end off and then you can clean out the proper areas. And then cotton bud, in the end, give it a good wipe round in here, give it a good wipe round. Now you might notice right the way through this, I didn't tip it upright like this, okay? Because we don't want it flowing this way, we want it all going this way. So we've always held it this way as we've gone right the way through, okay? Then for your nozzle, as we said before, um, I don't know, you haven't said if you're using one of these airbrushes, but if you haven't got the correct tool to do it, you can come in with a wooden cocktail stick and just gently tap and then hopefully, it's not so much, this is just paint, but you would get a blob at the end. Okay, but you want to use a wooden cocktail stick because the thing is if you come out with anything thicker than a cocktail stick um, or anything stronger, you can splay open the end of your nozzle and you really don't want to do that. Okay, and then it's just a case of just popping in and flushing in with your needle and just drag it across your finger and let it all flow down. If it's not flowing, then you can come in, just give it a nudge. Okay, and then you can try and blow it. The other thing you can do, of course, is just to grab your needle. Okay, and just gently, don't ram it again, just push him. And just rubbing round. Okay, and then ideally you want to use a, a clean, long, bristled brush. And to be honest, I don't really have a long, clean, bristled brush. So again, just... A little bit of thinners or airbrush cleaner then just give it it in and give it a nudge and just poke it all out get rid of it okay and then blow it okay give it a brush get this all out And hopefully, you can see, we've got daylight through there, which is the great thing about it. Really, you could try, you know, if you want daylight down there, you'll be fine. The other thing as well, don't forget cleaning out this end as well. I said about it before. So you'd be amazed how much rubbish builds up in here. It is important that it's clear because it will affect your airbrushing pan. Okay, so once that's clear, you're all good to go. And then you can just pop the nozzle in. End on that goes in, slide through, color cut, end cap, blow. Good sign if nothing's come out at all, and then in. Again, crystal clear, and you're back in business. Now, to be honest. You know, I showed you the long-winded way of doing that, and you can see total nothing at all coming through there. Okay, that was the long-winded way of doing it, but honestly, you know, it's sometimes better to admit it to feet and think, ah, it's not working, the bloody thing's crap, and I'm going to start again and, and go through the motions of it, than it is just sitting there pumping the trigger, because, say, you're literally just going to be bunging it all up. Okay, so honestly, sometimes admit defeat, walk away from it, and uh, go from there than rather trying to fight it and everything else as you make your way through okay uh right are we done then uh uh right so there we go hopefully that works for you ready let me just check the main site nope we are all clear right class dismissed that's it you can all go in now
I'll ring the bell. I need a bell for doing this. So there we go. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, to be honest, as I said, I've got an absolute shed load of work to do because I've got video editing. I've got various parts. We've got the next part ready for you to sort out for the actual doing the King Tiger. So we want to get that one because that one's going to be finished off you. I've got a great show for you tomorrow. You have to watch it because me and Jamie had a great thing. We spoke about obviously his naval career. I've got some bits of photos up there and he spoke about how he does uh, and his inspirations and his thoughts behind, which I think is a great way of listening to modelers. I know you guys listen to me a lot, but it's lovely hearing it from another person's perspective as well. Um, and as I say, he's a great guy, uh, very, very talented modeler to the point of stupidly clever. Um, so uh, he is very, very good at it. We'd love to have him back. But so I've got a great interview with him. It's about an hour, a few giggles along the way and all the rest of it. Um, so that'll be up with you tomorrow night as well. And obviously I'll get that Hobby Boss review up with you tomorrow. So tomorrow will be absolutely stacks of stuff. So I don't know about me actually getting on with the show, uh, but hopefully I'll do it like that. So there we go, that is it for tonight. That's about your basic painting, priming, laying down colors, and obviously hopefully we've covered a few more and dispelled a few more myths about airbrushing and actually how much fun it is. But honestly, if I can give any of you one piece of advice with airbrushing, enjoy it. It is supposed to be fun. I know so many people stress out about it and how it drives them mad and, and it is, but honestly, understand what's going on and when it's not working, think about it and also don't be afraid to admit defeat. So i.e. if your paintwork's not working, if your colors you just can't get right, dump them, start afresh, okay? Clean out your airbrush, make sure it's clean and running fine, make up a fresh batch of your paint and then continue on with your painting because it should be fun, it should be enjoyable right the way through. It should be no different from sanding or filling and everything else like that, which are problem areas to do, but once you know what you're doing with it, it's pretty straightforward and it's exactly the same as airbrushing. So thank you very much for joining me tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. I'll catch you all modeling tomorrow, well, hopefully. And so uh, happy modeling till tomorrow and take care. And thank you to everybody in the chat. You've been an absolute pleasure as always. I love having you in there. It's great. So uh, till tomorrow, everybody, happy modeling. Take care.